post darwinism so what are the what were the impacts of the darwin's theory we have learned about the principles of the, the theory of evolution as well as the natural selection so what were the repercussions what were the the the, the impacts of the theory on uh, the human thought process as a whole so uh, what were the philosophical issues that is the first part of this uh, brief talk so you know the static earlier before darwin it, thought to be completely static the evolution doesn't happen nothing is evolving it's all uh, you know same as the god created uh, plants and animals you know so just like matter so it's a static ceaseless universe made by the god it's the same thing that plato's uh, essentialism or aristotle's idealism all are same but change or dynamicity that is what the darwin's theory is all about the change it's centered on the change it's centered on the dynamicity everything is uh, you know in a uh, you know in a state of changing we are all evolving of course human beings are evolving too viruses are evolving too right the covid 2 uh, delta variants and other variants isn't it i mean is there anything static in the university if you have, if you thought like that meditation Right, if you're if you're meditating yourself, do you think it's stillness? Yeah, I mean, in in terms of the theory of relativity of the Einstein, you can say, okay, uh, in relative to other things around me, I'm still perfectly reasonable. But you see, the Earth is rotating very fast, and Earth is orbiting around the Sun, right? And do you know the speed of this uh, orbital revolution? It's approximately 30 kilometers per second. Per second, 30 kilometer we are traveling. So there is nothing static in the world, in the universe, indeed, right? So that kind of theory of the idealism is completely wrong. And more importantly, purpose versus function, the theological uh, or existential, you know, um, uh, what is that? Existential proof or uh, you know that um, uh, giving the rationale, citing the reason for being, is completely changed by a post-Darwinian theory. You know, so yeah. So before Darwin, philosophers asked like, why questions citing the purpose, what the God had in His mind to create, like for example, a, a lotus, pink lotus. Why it is pink? Because there is a fun, there, there is a purpose, not function, but it's a purpose. The God had it. So this is a deterministic. So as if it's predetermined, like fortune, you know, if you believe in that kind of thing. So it is closely and intricately intertwined with religious thought, the deterministic. Like as if we are very special, each of us have got uh, a very important purpose of our life. All these are teleological fallacy, you know. So that before Darwin, all this uh, purpose mattered immensely. But post Darwin, everything changed into the function, you know. Uh, so the why questions we are now uh, citing the natural selection to answer, especially the the traits, the animal traits. What would be the adaptive functionality, you know, for any kind of uh, the trait? For example, why uh, human beings in uh, tropics are black in color like if you go to the, the south india it's quite dark in color so as in africa why is it so there is a function why the melanin is overly expressed there right in response to the more temperature isn't it so it is basically uh, it is an adaptation to counterbalance the harmful uv radiations isn't it so yes so that functionality is really important so today uh, we the evolutionist uh, ask what what is the function of this pink color of the lotus or magnolia right not the purpose what is the function or hydrogen bond what is the function of it so function in the sense the scientific function you know not the purpose as in somebody had the end in their mind a teleological thing so you need to incite or invoke uh, the higher order reasoning you know you need to invoke the supernatural power if you're talking about 
purpose but for function no it is more objective reality so i hope you are getting the point about purpose versus function so there is a drastic shift from purpose to function post darwinism yet another thing is something called mediocrity principle so uh, we tend to think that we are very special you know whoever you be everybody think that okay we are really really special people because there is a purpose of our life you know existentialism if you think about it and uh, nobody want to say oh we are just mediocre who want to say that whatever be you know for example your caste is really the best caste in the world your religion is the best in the world and your nationality the your nation is the best nation in the world you know and your species is the best anthropocentrism that itself is a fallacy all these thing are you know cognitive biases so actually the principle post darwinism is something called mediocrity principle so there is nothing special that human being is in this you know in this uh, uh, amongst 10 million species which are co-inhabiting with us on the planet earth you know so that mediocrity principle is really important which is against the anthropocentrism so nothing special about uh, an individual's life you know omniscientism everybody is important everything is important like religion there are 10000 religions in the planet earth each religion have its own holy book you know established religion per se is around 4000 and each religion is special there is nothing like one religion is better than other you know that is fallacy isn't it so as nationality how many countries do we have in on the planet more than 200 countries so every country is special you know so that exactly is what you call it as mediocrity principle so nothing very unusual about evolution of the solar system solar system is not that special you know 100 billion galaxies we have in the in the uh, observable universe alone so out of which uh, our own galaxy is just one among it the milky way and in the our galaxy there are so many planetary system solar system is just one among thousands of planetary system in our own galaxy so earth or humans or any one nation so that principle is called mediocrity principle that is completely challenged the earlier world view pre darwin versus post darwin so uh, the impact is tremendous in our own world view and philosophical view theology to theology deals with the religious thought you know so pre copernican post copernican so you might know what copernicus said that the earth is not the center of the universe so pre copernicus people thought that we are living in a very special planet planet earth is really special because it's our own planet same rationale that human being is special because we are human you are special because it's you <laughs> you know so yes yeah, so that is what the the, the copernicus said that no earth is just a one planet you know and uh, it's not that everything the entire universe is revolving around earth though we see that way it is nothing but a illusion in reality earth is revolving around orbiting around the sun that is what the copernicus said it's completely uh, changed the world view before and after copernicus by the way as i told you earlier also it's not the copernicus who first coined this particular heliocentric concept it was aristarchus in early greece aristarchus could able to think freely because you know the freedom of thought and uh, uh, you know the dissent dissent means speaking something against the authorities are accepted in ancient greece and there is a reason this kind of things you know like democracy or even science were born in ancient greece you know so aristarchus did the same thing he said that uh, he- heliocentrism i mean uh, earth is not the center but post uh, greek uh, you know the the, uh, the the ancient greek history then comes the religious middle ages right so when the christianity was ruling all around the europe in throughout the middle ages so that time it was completely suppressed that thought then of course copernicus said that again now the darwin did quite similar instead of this uh, geocentrism pre darwinism concentrated on human 
anthropocentrism you know geo versus anthropo is quite similar so the whole world the biodiversity is all made by god for human being one specific species which is very special human is a top of the, the evolutionary ladder all are mistaken you know so that 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 particular world view have completely decimated by the darwin in his original species book you know so copernicanism is about the sun centered solar system uh you know of course the solar system is centered on uh, the star called sun isn't it and the entire universe of course uh, it is not our solar system is not the center so that copernicanism of course the aristarchian view is uh, quite similar and it is quite similar to the impact uh, of the darwinism so darwinism is that the humans are nothing but just an animal and nothing special so no special position and no ladder of evolution you know so our great grandfathers were apes not god so that was a big revolution you know so that is the reason why uh, darwin's original species is condemned by religious institutions especially abrahamic religions there are a lot of opposition to the the original species in uh, many schools and many religious institutions around the world even turkey is the book is banned you know so you will be imprisoned if you happen to carry original species to turkey even today because uh, the turkey the government has banned it so as in the united states several of the us schools have banned teaching darwinism to its children fortunately that is that didn't happen here in india because we are a lot more tolerant you know the, the culture is a lot more tolerant i'm really proud about it and yes so uh, there is a yes yeah, so that last point which i said the great grandfathers were apes not god so that is the atheistic point of view in the in the you know the original species that is a uh, i mean in in that sense darwin was an atheist an original species is an atheist book so it it actually completely changed the way that we think about rationality uh, that th we think about morality and ethics too so there is a uh, another, yet another a logical fallacy called argumentum ad consequentiam which i introduced in uh, you know when we talked about logical fallacy as part of yet another course so reasoning is uh, uh, is quite uh, you know uh, predictable like this it goes like this teach the children that they are animals they will behave like animals you know so <laughs> that is that is a justification why you should not teach the children that they are animals the justification that you, why you should not teach darwin's theory of evolution to the children because the consequentialist what is going to happen if you teach they will behave like what the animals are doing you see so of course the morality is highly uh, human centric isn't it entire humanitarian uh, humanitarian disciplines are all uh, you know uh, human centric for example economics what is the economics to do with the uh, animals you know uh, politics you know religion i mean everything is human centric so you cannot really extend that to the animals and justify that teaching evolution is bad you see so argumentum at consequentium takes this uh, this route x is true or false because how much i like or dislike its consequences and justifying the beginning and mean you know means to achieve that end you know see but the idea is that if even if teaching evolution and creates immorality that would not imply that evolution was false so science deals with objective facts you know so teaching objective facts disrespective of its consequences merits attention in modern society you know so that this kind of uh, logical fallacies uh, you know it is a, it doesn't actually justify anything so uh, of course inheritance of variations uh, darwin was clueless how actually it worked you know even though he had a fantastic theory of the evolution exact 
way that evolution works was unknown uh, during the period of the Darwin, though uh, the rigor mental was uh, contemporary to the Darwin, you know. So, in many instances, the Darwin wondered how certain characters reappear after many generations. That is exactly what you call it as a Darwinism, you know. So, the quote from the origin goes like this. Why did child often revert in certain characters to its grandfather or grandmother or much more remote ancestor? Why a peculiarity is often transmitted from one sex to both sexes or to one sex alone or more commonly but not exclusively to the like sex? So the last part of that sentence is something to do with the same sex inheritance, the mother to uh, you know the daughter and father to the son like sex you know the inheritance between the sex mitochondrial inheritance so he is referring to the concept that we take it for granted these these days but he didn't know that how exactly it worked so after he published the original species one of the uh, uh, english uh, mathematician he was basically an engineer called fleming jenkin he criticized uh, the Darwin's original species, uh, you know. So he reviewed the origin when he wanted to publish it. He reviewed it anonymously. Remember, blind peer review. It was common in England in 19th century. Look at that, 1867. Now it's a current gold standard, right? So what did he say that he criticized the so-called swamping criticism that natural selection doesn't work under the assumption of the blending inheritance because. Uh, the Darwin thought the inheritance blends like you're mixing the, you know, different colors together, you know, buckets of uh, white paint with uh, uh, blue paint and another bucket of uh, red paint. If you mix together, so how does it work? So he thought that way. Darwin was old, of course. So, you know, suppose each sexual pair had 100 offspring of which one spot survived. To reproduce that is what the fleming jenkin postulated the spot here means uh it's a variant you know mutant or a variant that is what the spot it's an old english term right rare spot arising in a population will slowly dilute away and cannot fight off averaging force of blending you know so if you do that blending that like paint jar mixing so the force of averaging force of blending is super strong that that one rare spot can never survive so he put an analogy of course uh, remember that these are in 19th century of the england uh, you know it is like a heights of racism there right of course racism is condemned now but during those days everybody was racist even darwin was racist in one sense Fleming Jenkin cited this uh, analogy that white man after shipwreck arriving in an island of black man. You know, only one white man arrives in an island of the black man. So what he will do? So he will he would kill many blacks in the struggle for the existence. You know, he is going to kill many black men for uh, in order to exist. You know. So, can anyone believe that the whole island will gradually occur white or even yellow population? Is it possible that the island is going to change into the black or even to the yellow population? So, you know, if you think that way, like what Darwin postulated earlier, like mixing of the paints. No, it doesn't. You know, so uh, the, the reasoning of the Fleming Jenkin is valid. In case you assume that, uh, you know, the, the inheritance happens through blending. But that mode is not what really happened, right? But Darwin, of course, he was not really a trained mathematician. So he he always acknowledged that the mathematics uh, was really mediocre. <laughs> so that is one of the reasons even my own students always say that they choose biology because they don't, you know, they don't like maths. It sucks maths. That is the reason that they don't want to choose physics or math intensive field engineering so instead they want to choose biology botany or zoology so darwin was quite typical you know so because of his mediocre math ability so if uh, a person who is an engineer very good with maths he criticizes darwin 
citing the maths, uh, the folly of maths in his theory, then he acknowledged it. And then he changed, the, you know, that, that is a drastic consequence of this criticism. He changed the fifth edition of the origin to reflect the Fleming's point and corrected individual, where, wherever the term individual variation, the phrase happened, he completely changed that to any variation, not just one variation, but any variation. It's like control F and replace enter phrase, phrase to every single instance throughout the book uh, to the plurals, you know, any variation. So he also added the following paragraph. So it's basically individual variation. He changed that into individual variations, the plural from singular, any variation to any variations. Are you getting the point? So one variation cannot survive, but you need a lot more variation in order to transmit. So that is what. So he also added the following paragraph into the fifth edition. I also saw that uh, the preservation in a state of nature as opposed to under the domestication of any occasional deviation of structure such as monstrosity would be a rare event and that if preserved would generally be lost by subsequent intercrossing with ordinary individuals. It will be lost, he acknowledged, you see. Nevertheless, until reading an able and valuable article in the North British Review, I did not appreciate how rarely single variations, whether slight or strongly marked, could be perpetuated. So he completely surrendered with his criticism that appeared in this uh, particular North British Review anonymously. Uh, the uh, Jenkin published that, you know, so he completely accepted that and he completely changed it. See, this is a problem in many of the good books which I came across, the first edition is the best. It, it's original, but subsequent edition keep on diluting the original theory uh, in order to accommodate the difference of opinion, you know. So, of course, the original species to the first edition is the best edition. Then all the subsequent edition, he kind of diluted his original profoundly uh, you know original ideas yeah so then comes yet another of the mathematician Arthur Sl Sladen Davis uh, he published a, you know rebuttal in uh, 1871 in nature so uh, what he said is that if only one offspring survive it's a recipe of rapid population shrinking and eventual species extinction take anything for granted i mean um, even today's example you know like white rhino only one species uh, only one individual of that uh, species exists then what will happen if that individual dies that that will lead to the extinction event right you need at least two and that should be male and female isn't it so yes you need at least two one male and female in order to survive so that is what you need to accommodate that you need at least two individual if you make this correction, effect of that sport will never die out. So one of the examples of the uh, Davis is that black cat introduced into the white cat population. Kittens will get progressively lighter, but the dark hue will never get disappeared. So he supported the argument of the Darwin in, in this way, you know. So that then comes the discussion about the particulate inheritance. So the variations too comes from mutations, but mutations was not known in the Darwin's time, even though the Gregor mental was contemporary, but he was working in uh, Czech Republic, you know, though he is basically part of the Austrian emperor, right? Uh, yes, it's very nearby, Czech Republic and Austria, pretty nearby, but Austrian emperor was super strong, so it was, uh, uh, you know, uh, ruled by the Czech, Czech Republic was ruled by the Austria during those times. So genes were not known during the Darwin spirit. So the Darwin spirit is 1809 to 1882, while Mendel contemporary, a little bit younger, 1822 to 1884. You know, he died pretty young comparing with the Darwin, you know. So prevailing belief was blending inheritance during the Darwin's time. So, however, this problem had already been solved by then by Gregor Mendel in uh, 1865, you know, but never known until its rediscovery by Hugo Davries, the French uh, biologist, you see. 
So particulate inheritance is the currently accepted, the blending inheritance is, it doesn't work, you know. So the heredity is not by the blending of this kind of alleles, but particulate because the genes are, uh, you know, like particle, it actually, it, it never actually mixes up. You know? So even just one variant can eventually um, uh, completely change the frequency of that variant if uh, conditions are favorable and conducive then the entire population can be completely taken over by that particular mutant uh, if you look at that the model of the mentalian heredity is concerned the particulate inheritance so at this juncture if i ask you one simple question you know the penicillin was discovered of course by uh, you know the alexander fleming in 1928 right so when he discovered it was a serendipitous discovery you know it so antibacterial compound uh, produced by the living or the penicillin is an antibiotic isn't it so after 10 years what has happened is that the penicillin is no more effective even today of course the amoxicillin is a derivative of the penicillin but the original penicillin compound the natural penicillin doesn't work anymore every single penicillin available in the market uh, has been chemically modified do you know why? Because bacteria is now, you can see most of the bacteria are penicillin resistant, you know. So the, the antibiotic resistance, it's a, it's a form of natural selection. In, in, in a way, it is not natural, but it's an artificial selection, isn't it? Uh, yes, it's an evolution, isn't it? So now the question here is that, which among the following is true regarding the penicillin resistance in bacteria? A they existed that means the penicillin resistant bacteria existed before the invention of penicillin b they evolved after the in invention of penicillin penicillin resistant bacteria how is it possible to exist before the invention of penicillin isn't it penicillin was invented only in you know 18 um in 1928 before the alexander fleming uh, invented the penicillin how is it possible that the penicillin resistant bacteria existed before that isn't it so of course it is evolved after the invention of penicillin isn't it so the answer has to be b isn't it no answer is a so the reason is that uh, you know that the nature doesn't actually impart forcefully impart certain mutation no nature only sieves some mutants from the pool of completely random mutations so mutations are completely random it could have happened before the invention of penicillin too the penicillin resistant uh, you know the, the so-called spot right in old english they call it as spot the mutants so variations are spontaneous you know uh, it's caused by the random mutations on the dna because of the uv exposure or because of the recombination you know or replication errors all these things right crossovers right so which is not directed by the environment so many students have this thinking that uh, that the environment is causing the mutants to arise if you go back one slide so many other analogs i can cite for example mosquitoes you know, after the invention of liquidator, like uh, good night or whatever, right? Uh, all out. Now you can see a lot of mosquitoes are becoming resistant to that liquidator. So does that mean that mosquito, that, uh, you know, that uh, liquidator resistance evolved after the invention of liquidator? No, it is not. It might have happened before as well, you know, or rat traps. Now, nowadays, you can see that many of the rats are avoiding the traps that the, the, we, are, we are putting in. Is it because of the invention of the traps? No, not really. Or insecticide or herbicide resistant, just like the antibiotic resistance, you know. So, yes, so the mutations are completely random. So, all the nature does is to select best fit variation among the pool of variants. You know? So, variants might be there before such uh, you know selective sieve come to the existence so 
uh, you know, there's a very famous experiment in genetics by Salvador Luria and Max Delbruck. Luria Delbruck experiment that the spontaneous gene mutations in bacteria are not directed by the environment. So mutations arise in the absence of selection. So selection is not the root cause of the mutations. So mutations comes first, then some variants are selected. So selection comes later, you know. So it's not that the selection for certain mutations, site-directed mutagenesis, no, right? So this is that famous experiment. So if the mutations are induced by the media, so what they did is that, so it's basically about a, a plague forming unit of the bacterial lawns. So, you know, bacterial fudge forms the plague. So what they did is the, uh, they, they did uh, this plating, right? And if it is basically induced by the media, these plagues are induced by the media, then roughly you will see a kind of the same number of mutants that can grow in that media, you see. So each plate, like the plate one has got two mutants, plate two has got two mutants. So whatever the colony that can grow are mutants, you see, either antibiotic mutants or the plague resistant, or phage resistant mutants, isn't it? So if the media is inducing, then you will expect to see kind of similar kind of mutants. But what they found is that drastically vary. Some plates have only uh, one mutant or two mutants. Some plates have only one mutant. Some plates have got four mutants. Some have none. Some have two. So it all depends where exactly that mutation happens, isn't it? If the mutation happens at this replication, only one. If this happens at many generations earlier, then you will see that so many mutants are happening. So what they did is that they proved it that, you know, the spontaneous mutation, not the induced mutation by looking at the, uh, you know, the is it following the poison distribution or not poison distribution. So if this is the case, then this is a more or less a random distribution of the poison. If this is the case, then it's not poison. It's not random. So what they found is that it is not poison distribution. Poison is, by the way, it's a random probabilistic distribution of count variables like the colony. Colony can count it, right? Like Gaussian distribution, we, we introduced these terms when we discussed about uh, statistics, right? Gaussian for continuous variable and poison for discrete variables. So here the variable is a discrete, so it's poison. So what? Uh, Luria Delbruck found is that it's basically, uh, you know, the not poison distribution. So had it been poison, then it's induced mutation, but it's the distribution is not poison. And because the variance are much greater than the mean. Remember, there is a term called VMR, variance to mean ratio that you can uh, rely on to, you know, to guess is it poison or not. So, yes. So it was non-random, you know, so that is uh, what the, the Luria and uh, Delbruck's experiment proved. So yet another very important uh, uh, theory after the Darwin is uh, re-emergence of Lamarckism. So, you know, Lamarckism is all about uh, whatever the acquired uh, behavior, the inheritance of that. So how is it possible? So uh, uh, on our lifetime, whatever the changes that we acquire, can we transmit to our next generation? So, of course, not if you think about classical genetics, but if you think about uh, think about epigenetics, then yes. So, whatever the, the environment have induced us, whatever the changes that has been conferred by the environment, like the plants developing thicker leaves when grown in hot, dry environment, can be passed on to the offspring through epigenetics, like histone modification and DNA methylation. You know, so that is exactly what this uh, neo Lamarckism is all about. Re emergence of the Lamarckism. So, a number of recent studies have suggested that inheritance of uh, acquired behavioral traits, not via the, the classical genetics, the, the DNA sequences, but via epigenetic mechanisms. You know, uh, yes. So, uh, one example is foraging behavior in chicken as a function of stress. Foraging means eating and it's kind of similar in human beings too, right? If you are really stressful, if your lifestyle, then chances are high that you overeat. 
you know you tend to become sedentary and uh, you you know so that that kind of behavior is common in uh, human beings too so even in chicken yes so that foraging behavior can be transmitted from one generation to another through epigenetics we have good proof it's a nature article i'll just show you now or father rats can transfer propensity for obesity to their daughters as a result of father's food intake very interesting isn't it if the father are obese uh, you know while having the baby you know while procreating then the female offsprings are tend to be fatter you know in in the case of rats there are papers on that line as well and not through the genes it is epigenetic transmission you know and in plants there are several studies we have about the epigenetic transmission so this is a very interesting paper published so many years back in detail chronic high fat diet in fathers programs beta cell dysfunction in female rat offspring again through epigenetics another uh, paper in plus one inheritance of acquired behavioral adaptations and brain gene expression in chickens brain gene expression friends we can uh, you know even our behavior can be completely altered by epigenetic mechanisms so it is uh, exactly what the lamarck said many many uh, decades ago right centuries ago so that is exactly what neo lamarckism is about so other post darwinian developments that we will introduce subsequently in uh, this course are modern evolutionary synthesis theory of neutral evolution by motto kimura and punctuated equilibrium by stephen jay gold right and levantine of course uh, you uh, you know you can wait for subsequent modules for all these things so all these things are uh, after darwin right darwin's uh, theory of natural uh, theory of evolution by natural selection 